Hi, I'm Barry Godin and welcome back to BG Tips, episode 9. And today is going to be a bumper packed issue because this is probably the items I carry the most of on my bike. This is navigation and electronics. Due to filming my adventures and I wanted to carry drones and various things like that, it's a lot of stuff. Um, I'm not going to teach you how to use it, so I'm going to teach you how to use a Garmin, but I can do in future videos. So if there's something particularly you want covering, please put it down in the comments. I'll make a little list of it and there can be more video ideas for the future. I have a lot, but I could do more as well all the time. So at the top of the list, we're going to start old school. We're going to start with maps. So they are beautiful things. They are incredible. But they're massive and not that practical to take with you. This is some of the best mapping we have in the world is in the UK. It's Ordnance Survey. So Ordnance Survey started in 1791. So they've been doing it for a few years. They kind of know what they're doing. It started off from the war. They tried to map out exactly the land they were going to go and conquer and where they could be. But the best thing about them is the fact they've got contour lines that marked every wall in the, in the whole of England and the UK. Um, every tree, every mound, you name it, it's on here. So if you've passed a forest and you've got a wall come up on your left hand side, you'll know exactly where you are on the map and you can then turn to whatever footpath you need. The other amazing thing about it, but I'll teach you how to read them another day, is the fact they show you all the bridleways, they show you how all the footpaths, all the tracks, everywhere you can go and be. So they are quite an incredible, beautiful thing and you must use more of them. So I'll mainly use maps for planning. And during that, you can have them large scale. You can work out where this bit of bridleway you can link up to the other bit of bride away on the other side you particularly want to ride. Also, you can see which kind of forest and what sort of track you might be on. They might kind of hide behind the woods that you can kind of maybe go and wild camp in. Um, so it gives you loads of good scopes. But the biggest thing is contour lines. I can now kind of read an OS map and know when I go around the corner what that landscape might look like. Obviously, I'm a bit stunned when I get there as well, but you have a really good guess of what is coming up. So why can't I carry it with me? Well, that is the maps needed just for the English Lake District. Well, that's quite a lot um, and quite a large volume and a lot of weight. Uh, also, plus, even if you're going for a day's ride, you'll probably cross from one map into another map because it just happens to be the way it splits. It'll be across two maps. And especially if you're bikepacking from like Land's End to John O'Groats, you're going to be carrying a lot of maps. So OS do do two scales. They do 1 to 50 and they do 1 to 25. 1 to 25, and he's going to see every single wall, every single tree, every single rock there is in the landscape. This one is a little bit further out, but if you're a road cyclist or you're doing light gravel, that was not kind of too extreme. These are great maps because they're a lot larger scale. You won't have to carry as many with you, um, and they give you more than enough information most of the time. But if you are going to the wilds, it's worth looking at the 1 to 25 series. On various national trails, you'll find they'll actually make a little map for the whole route. So this is a map for the sandstone trail, which is worth trying to pick up and take in with you because it's not very big. That should cover the entire trail. So if you come off, you may get a bit lost, but you can kind of work out on here how you can get back to it. So do look up trails online. They are often a little map or PDF download you can take with you. So that's a real great one to look for. Other countries do make beautiful maps. They do come in quite expensive. This is 20 pounds for a Austrian map, but they are again are very, very beautiful. They're not as quite as detailed as our maps in the UK, um, but they are just a thing of beauty. I kind of like maps and uh, you see all these big mountains, it makes you all excited. Um, other ones that are kind of not so great value for money is the Icelandic maps, because <laughs> when you're there, you buy one of these maps to work out what's in that area, and you realize <clears throat> it's just a big map of a glacier, <laughs> which I wouldn't call great value for money, unless you're on the glacier, which if you are on your bike, you might be in the wrong place. So what do we now do in the digital age? Well, OS has an app. You can download every single 1 to 25 map and every 1 to 50 map onto your phone, which is incredible. I think you cost 20 or 30 pounds a year. That is a bargain. 
You can download the maps to make them offline, so you don't have to be connected to the internet. You can zoom in and zoom out really easily and swiftly. Um, you can also put your route on there, which means you can see mile markers. You can see how far you've got to go the next day. I'll use this for when I'm sitting in my tent in the evening or halfway through the day, trying to work out how far I've got to get to, what's coming up. Um, so that's what I use this for, because it's great. You can zoom around and it's amazing. Um, so do try and download the maps before you go, because you can't have internet connection where you are. But don't trust the GPS on it, because GPS on your phone isn't as accurate as it is on other devices. So you might be your dot showing where you are, you're actually not there, you're of somewhere else. But if you can learn to read the maps, as I was explaining earlier, you can actually use this as a paper map. You can even take bearings off of it as well to properly map read with a, a compass. So even though we've got all these digital items, it makes it all much easier, do take one of these because if you get stuck, this can really get you out of trouble. Especially if you're up high, you have a whiteout, you can't see where you're going. You can actually take compass bearings from your phone. It's not as easy as it on the map, but you can actually do some good things with this as well. Don't trust your compass in your phone because that'll be calibrated correctly. And also, if you're near magnetic objects, careful because you can be swayed where north is. But take, don't skimp out on this compass. Buy one that's fairly expensive, about 20 quid, and it's going to really work. The cheap ones, you'll have noticed north kind of varies every couple of seconds where it's going to be. But do carry a decent compass. So another day, we're going to browse my bookcase because as you notice, there's a lot of guidebooks in there. There's a lot of mountain biking books. There's other people's journeys. I get so inspired by those things. I kind of get all the paper maps out, work out how they got there. Can I go and link those up or can I add another bit on as well? Depending on the experiences they had when they were doing it. But yeah, I have to say you can't be a decent good book when it comes to planning and getting ideas. So next up is how do I navigate on the bike? I'm mainly a Garmin person. I've recently got this Wahoo Bolt, which I intend to try and use. Um, it's kind of really good for road-based stuff. Not so great for heavy off-roading. And the major reason is because that's why I have this Garmin 1000. On here, I have every single 1 to 25 OS map on here for the entire of the UK, which means when I'm riding and go anywhere, I can see exactly where I am. Garmin's and GPS units are incredibly accurate. You're going to know if you've gone more than one meter past the trail, you can always come back again. You're not going to be halfway down the mountain before you realize. So, and these I mainly use because I put my route on it, which I plan on a computer. I put it on this device. I turn off all navigation by its objects itself, and I literally follow that route. Um, but knowing where you are on an OS map in real time is a thing of beauty. It really, really is amazing. And that's the major reason why I use this one. This is Garmin 1000. There's a new version called the 1030. There's an 830 as well, but this is a bigger color screen. It's easier to see where you're going in such a detailed map. This is a Garmin eTrex 30. We purely use this in Iceland. It was bought only for Iceland trip. A bit's been used in a few others since. It takes AA batteries and rechargeable ones. That means its battery life was a hell of a lot longer. It isn't as smart as this one here, in terms of it's not got a colour screen, it's quite a basic map. But for Iceland we couldn't really get decent mapping, so it didn't matter too much. Um, but the battery life on this is incredible. On a set of double A's, rechargeable double A's, we're getting two to three days out of it. This, I barely get five to seven. So if you are carrying one of these Garmin's, make sure you've got a battery pack with you, because you will get stuck. A lot of people use two, especially racers. They use one for navigation and one for tracking. So, and as a backup as well, if one goes down, you haven't got to try and find a recharger or if you haven't got a battery brick, you can just run off the other one. So that's often why you might want to take two in cases. So this next section is going to start looking at some of the camera gear I take with me. So from the very start, I've always had a GoPro from the first one ever created. They've improved dramatically over time, but do be aware it's only useful if you use it in a creative way. So put it in interesting places, turn it backwards, face the other way, face your friend. So you need to move it around up. It's going to get very boring very quickly. So that's where various mounts come in. I find the chest mount when it comes to descending, even for bike packing, I take it with me. Um, it means that I'm going to have a really good position. You see your arms, it's all very exciting. You get a bit more of the how steep it is or how technical it is. Um, I do find on the helmet shot is not the most interesting sometimes. 
Um, luckily, my helmet has this little clip that puts in there. That means that the mount will go in there, which is quite smart. Other living mounts, you can get these sticky pads, which means you can stick them to your bike, stick them to your helmet, stick them to something. And you can clip your GoPro in there as well. Um, you can point it backwards, um, various other different mounts. And we've got these little brackets, which kind of turn it 90 degrees. So on my bike, which I can show you another time, I actually have a metal GoPro mount. I do find some of these plastic brackets, which I use for quite a while, they kind of flex a lot, and especially if you get aggressive, they really, really have a good wobble factor. So I then went for this K-Edge metal mount, which means I lose a lot of that wobble. Um, yes, the new GoPro is super smooth. Quite funnily, it's almost too smooth. I look a bit slower in this. Um, what was annoying though, from I had a four, I had two fours or three fours at one point for so many years. So they all had the same battery, I never upgraded. I then stupidly seem to have left that GoPro on a train at some point last year, um, which meant I then upgraded to the seven, which then the battery changed. But you probably notice, how do I charge this device up for such a long period of time? Well, the answer is lots and lots of batteries. I had 12 batteries for the last GoPro, um, which is bought for Iceland again. Everything was bought for Iceland and then continuously used on from then. Um, 12 was actually quite good in for a 10 day trip. I took all 12, I'd never have to recharge one. Yes, it's quite a lump, but when you realize you haven't got to try and charge this up five times a night with different batteries and swapping them in and out, which does take a while to charge, um, it's just easier to take more batteries. Yes, it's more weight, but from a filming point of view, it's easier, especially if you're on the trail, you just wanna switch in and switch out. Batteries carry multiples. So for the new one, I've only had it a little while, I'm only up to four or five or six with this one, I think. Um, I can't find the others. Um, and it's annoying they've changed it, but such is life. The other thing we're looking to as well, SD cards. How do you to make sure you're backing stuff up? Don't I can't back up everything on the trail. So I'll carry multiple SD cards, which means you just put a different in each day if you want to, or wait till it runs out, stick it in the next one. Um, they're cheap enough nowadays to just buy multiple keep them in a nice little hard case. This means it's kind of indestructible. Um, it has been under some abuse and it's survived quite well. So I would say just carry multiple cards and multiple batteries. That means this device, you don't have to worry about it in terms of charging wise and support wise. It will look after itself and you can use it more often, which means you might capture that spectacular crash <laughs> you weren't gonna film before because it wasn't on. You're never gonna film the crash if you're gonna, oh, I'm gonna crash now, no. Stick this on quite a lot of the time, then you capture those magical moments. So how to get creative filming? Well, carry lots of different devices that means you can get different shots. Selfie sticks are great, do carry them. They're brilliant, but they're quite big to carry with you. Then the range of Joby tripods. These are brilliant, you see all the collection of them over here. They're really great because you can wrap them around trees and they'll stay anywhere, so they're quite cool but they often slip, they often fall over, and they're quite hard to get the shot level. So many times I come back and the shot's a bit a bit wonky. Um, this one's a great one. I tried to clip this onto a bike once, but I realized it vibrated so much. Um, but great for like here, I can clip it onto the table, I can clip it onto a tree, something like that, and ride past. <laughs> Especially if you want to self-film yourself, you need a tripod. So my go-to ones were actually that one for a long while, and probably that one I took with me. They were great for self-filming, but you had to try and find a tree, or not a tree, but a rock, or a fence, or something, or a sheep that was higher than the ground, because otherwise every shot will be looking up from the floor. So how do I eventually solve it? Well, I did a research everywhere, and this is a Polaroid travel tripod. I don't think it's very expensive, I think it's about 12 quid, but I tell you what, these look super rusty, because this is what 90% of my films have been filmed on. It has extendable legs. And these extendable legs go so big that you can stand it on the floor and it'd be quite high. So you can get really interesting shots for once. You can get high, you can get low. If you put this on an object, you're much, much higher. I've actually filmed things past by holding it in the air as well. Um, you can get really interesting with this. So I strongly recommend it. I've broken probably about three of them because the way it kind of folds together and it got a bit bent, but for 12 quid, it's pretty damn good. It's not the lightest one in the world. Yes, I'd love a carbon fiber job in the future, 
Um, but for the time being, and it's a bit rusty, <laughs> for the time being, this is my go-to favorite tripod. So I'll try and link it below, but I can't really remember the name of it. It's the Polaroid Travel, Polaroid Travel tripod, and it does fall down quite easily. <laughs> But yeah, it's really smart. Has a little ball head joint so you can get your various shots and angles. But I can't go filming the venture without my best friend. This goes in the top of the, the frame bag. It's always there, ready to grab out, stick it up, do a few rides past as I do, run up and down the mountains, come back and get it, and off I go. So yeah, after all of these, that's my <laughs> rubbish go-to object. So other little cool objects you can take with you is this like egg timer thing. What's amazing about this, if you've got a time lapse, it will every so slightly move an angle. So you actually get a panning time lapse. Even if you do a video, it will pan very slowly over time. It actually makes your shots more engaging, more interesting and yeah, really cool. So I do take this quite often with me. I don't always use it, I often forget. And it's, during lunch it's fine, you can stick it there, but you're not gonna wait whilst you're riding past for it to kind of pan round. It's quite slow, but really cool. You can make your own out of an egg timer. Just stick a GoPro mount to the top of it, super glue it, and just watch it click by. So next thing is cables. Make sure you carry the cable for every object you're carrying. My Garmin is different to my GoPro, which is different to my phone. So make sure you carry them with you and multiples of them. The amount of times my phone cable breaks, and we're going to in a second, but my phone is my main filming object. I need it to work all the time. And also it's a navigation object, which I've also said I use. So I do carry about two or three phone cables. Um, I do have other ones which are slightly more indestructible, but I've been for a lot of phone cables over these years. Um, so I do carry multiples of them. So my GoPro is now USB-C, so that now has a charge of its own, but my charging bricks and my Garmin's are all micro USB. So these I carry a lot of them and lots of different links. So if I actually have on the bike, you'll see when I do a bike video, I actually have a dynamo, which I have a nice short one that can go through the tube and into the Garmin whilst I'm riding along. And I use other ones to charge other objects whilst I'm going about. So do carry multiple cables. All of this sounds like a huge um, amount to take, um, but it's something I've come to terms with taking. And that's why I'm known as not a light packer because I like filming my journeys. So next up, and whilst we're talking about filming, is my phone. So my phone has always been, for the past, I don't know how many years, an iPhone. And it gets upgraded every time they release a new one. Um, due to my phone contract, it's nothing a secret. Uh, but I have to say, yes, they are blimmingly expensive. But how much is an incredible video camera? Plus a navigational device, my Garmin's 400 quid. Um, this actually looks quite cheap when you realize it's your camera, it's your phone, it does everything. It's your internet, it's your social media. So that's why I do believe in it and it's giving me amazing results and results that people do question all the time. Like, what camera are you using? I said, iPhone, and they're like, what? So with the filming, 99% of it is done by the iPhone. Only shots on the bike do I use the GoPro for, just to make it a little bit more exciting and on the chest. But this one is the one I set up, I talk to, I hold it arm's length. Um, so this is a real workhorse and it's worked really, really well for me. You do need a decent mount. So I used to use this tripod mount, but it was quite stretchy, but it's a bit flimsy. That's by Joby again. Great company, but just a bit flimsy. So it ended up being the cheapest thing on the internet, which actually had a big, decent screw, which locks the camera in, which means I'm not scared of holding it over waterfalls. I was holding my phone over waterfalls with that and didn't trust it. I thought, oh no. But that, you lock it in tight. There's no way that's coming out, especially in the tripod or you're holding it somewhere stupid. Um, it's really, really great. So that's about two or three quid. Um, probably better than the more expensive ones you get out there. Other things you can do to improve your phone is using different lenses. These ones are really expensive ones. They're by a brand called Moment. I paid a fortune because I come from America and I got stabbed for the import tax duty. Um, I used them, they were really, really good, but I could still tell when they were on the camera in terms of the slightly blurry edge and just natural iPhone just always looked that little bit crisper, a little bit nicer. Um, so you can, don't buy the cheap ones out there. I say just stick to what you've got. Uh, obviously the new phone's got more lenses, it's really cool. And you can do multiple cameras at the same time, so I will probably get that at some point. Um, but yeah, these add-on ones probably aren't worth the value for money. So what's the best value for money thing you can do to improve all your footage? Buy a decent microphone. 
with a windshield. So for the iPhone, this one is incredible. It's called the Shure MV88. This is a beautiful stereo microphone. It's not cheap, but that's the best thing you can spend your money on to improve every single film. And this beautiful little, I uh, call Mr. Furry. So me and him go uh, everywhere together. He looks rather soggy because he's been in various lakes and rivers and got a bit stuck with things. And that clicks in the side of my phone. So that's what I'll be holding out and talking to the camera, get my stereo sound, get all those beautiful sounds around um, and really, really hopefully improve my films over the many years. That is worth every single penny. If you don't have an iPhone, there's plenty of things out there you can do to improve your audio. Another idea for microphones are these little chaps. These are clip-on lapel mics, which means you can clip these into your phone. You can then, any phone at all, you just need to buy the adapter cable, clip them into your phone, then you actually get really crisp, clear audio of your voice whilst you're riding along or having a chat or just wherever you are. So these are really great. This one was only about 12 quid. Well worth trying it. See what you think of it and you can take it from there. I can't pull this too far away because it's attached to my main microphone for these films. I'm using a Rode Video Mic Pro for these ones. It's a whopper of a mic, but it gives a really clean, crisp audio, um, and that's why I'm using it. And it's linked up to this Zoom recorder. I bought this many, many years ago, and it's a great buy. You can get really excellent, outstanding audio from this thing. It's a H2N, um, and it really, really is amazing. Again, buy the little furry cover for it. Um, it's gonna stop all that wind noise and make your audio crisp and clean. If you're not into visuals, maybe just take this. Get some nice audio scapes, build up a bit of a landscape, and you could do a bit of a, even more podcast with it as well as you're out and about. So there's loads of techniques and top tips there. Hopefully it makes your films a little bit better. Whilst we're on the phone, someone asked this question before, what headphones do you use? Yes, I listen to music when I'm in the afternoon, I'm having a low moment kind of picks me up a bit of Jamie kind of a bit of jazz while you're on a glacier, does help and keeps you going. Wired ones are probably the best to go for. Yes, they tangle up, they're a bit of a pain. You're connected to your bike, but I use that top tube bag to put my phone in. These can clip in there. Um, I only really run one if I'm on a road, only ever wear one if I'm on a road. I'm off road, I genuinely wear one as well because it means I can hear well, I want to hear the birds and the bees and the trees while I'm out and about. So if you're an iPhone user again, or you're one of these stupid phone companies who keeps taking the headphone jack off of their phones, you need to take a dongle thing. But take more than one of these. These things break in two seconds flat and you kind of have no audio for the rest of your trip. So do take a few of these. Ah, and top tip, a friend did forget to put any music on their phone before a trip. So off they went, ready to listen to music and they had nothing on their phone whatsoever. Nowadays, I'm actually these little Bluetooth headphones. These are a neck and a fire. A neck fire. <laughs> They're really cool, actually. They work really, really well. Um, they come in this little charging case, as loads of them do. Um, and they work really well. So next trip, I'll probably be taking these, but I'll still be taking my wired set because if I can't charge this up, well, at least I can still play some tunes of an evening. Carry on with technology. We also have a Bluetooth keyboard. I've taken this away quite a few times for writing diaries of an evening. It is really nice to be able to sit there, type away. You can have your phone propped up against your beer in the evening and type away. So these are really, really light. The battery lasts a really long time. I think I've got a whole week out of it. This one's by Logitech. Um, it's quite flexible as well, so it's not gonna snap too quickly. Really nice touching feeling keyboard. Um, so if you are a blog writer or something like that, do take this with you. You might want to think about it slips in your frame bag. It's not that much space. And um, it just makes those, uh, writing those essays and documents you've got so much easier of an evening. Wallet and keys. Well, your wallet hasn't got to carry much in it. So I don't take a full wallet. They just get stuffed in a little bag. I take my bank card. You need to make sure you take some cash because you'll be in the depths of somewhere and they won't accept a bank card. Um, so make sure you carry a little bit of cash, especially campsites of an evening. They don't really like to take bank cards. Um, and then don't forget your National Trust card. You can get loads of perks by that. Your YHA card, particularly for trips, um, carrying a white child is going to be really, really useful. And then your keys, find somehow to kind of tape them together or put them in a soft bag. You don't want to lose his either, so put them somewhere really, really safe. You don't want to get back after two weeks away and can't find your keys. Um, once I did actually leave them in my tent and I packed up my whole trip, got home, I couldn't find anything. So there I am, tearing my bike apart. I think, where was the last time I saw them? It was in the tent. 
So I remembered I stupidly left them in the pocket in the tent, so I did that, and there they were, and I got home nice and safe and sound. But that noise is really annoying after a while, so do find ways to silence everything on your bike, especially metal items. Yes, I'm a drone user. You all gonna ask that question. Um, this one I bought a little while ago. It's a DJI Spark. It is amazing quality for how small it is and how condensed it kind of folds up. Yes, you're gonna be taking liberties by taking this with you. Um, you're gonna be taking extra battery packs, chargers, kind of controllers, um, but some of the shots you can get are amazing. Don't make your whole video a drone video. Then it can gain like the GoPro and get very, very boring. But using it in creative ways and adding in with the other footage you've got can make a real quality film. Very sadly though, you're not gonna see a lot of my recent drone footage because we used loads of it in Scotland in the last few trips and um, I've seemed to have lost all the footage in a hard drive failure, which is devastating. But I intend to kind of talk you through those trips using photographs and things later on. But for the moment, you'll have to wait till the next trip to get some uh, drone footage. So what next? How the hell do I power all of this stuff for that period of time? Well, it involves taking enough battery packs to power a small city. Drone charger is massive, but the amazing thing about it is you can actually charge it off of one of these larger battery bricks. So that actually does trickle charge into the drone, so I can power that with one of these. So that's why eventually I first of all upgraded from these, which are 10,000, to these, which are 10,000, which are like half the size. Um, I was then carrying about four to five of these, and now we're now carrying probably four of these and uh, probably two or three of these. Um, I'll use these for my phone, and if I have to, the GoPro, but the GoPro's got its own batteries, but my Garmin generally needs it, but hopefully the Dynamo Hub powers that. But these will help power my drone, uh, which means I can keep playing with it, um, getting more quality shots in the wild, rather than, it only lasts 10, 15 minutes, you're gonna carrying it for a long time if you're only gonna get 10 minutes out of it. So it's worth carrying some power to be able to charge it. These are all anchor batteries, which I have to say have been a firm favorite for quite a long while. And um, these were TP Link, but they did well, but a couple of them died out and they were quite big as well. So these are 10,000 and these are 20,000 each. So you probably notice that how much I'm carrying. If you wanna work out a rough calculation, Look how big your batteries are in your phone or in your cameras. And then you can work out how many charges you're gonna get out of one of these. Yes, that once a week, I generally spend once a week in a youth hostel or somewhere like that. Then I spend the whole night charging these all up, which then leads, you have to carry the plugs to be able to charge these things up in a youth hostel or somewhere like that. Um, do carry one of these, but you can also get ones that have dual um, USB charges on them as well. That's worth carrying, so you can car charge a couple of things out of one power socket. You generally know everyone's fighting over power sockets in those places, so you might want to kind of commandeer just one, but have multiples coming out of it. And if you're going abroad, don't forget to carry the adapter plugs. These are also annoying and huge. This one does kind of sink in, which is quite nice. Try and find in that country one of their phone chargers, because they have a USB, and 100% of the stuff I'm carrying is charged via USB, so one of those or one of their smaller ones they sell, it's gonna be worth buying whilst you're there. And for that Garmin I was explaining earlier, the eTrex 30, I actually managed to find these really big rechargeable batteries. These are two and a half thousand milliwatts, it's, um, and they last a really long time, so that's how much to stretch the burn time of those batteries in that Garmin. And it has a really small little neat charger. This is called Freeloader, I believe it's called. I'm sure there's loads out there, but it means you can put your rechargeable batteries in the bottom, Charge of our USB, which is actually in the bottom, which is really smart. And um, yeah, it's a winning device actually, so quite smart if you're using double A's in your objects. So how else can you charge your devices? Well, use the power of the sun. This is a bit silly to say in England, but other places you're gonna go to, the sun is gonna be incredibly good for charging up your batteries. So for Iceland, we're using a Power Monkey um, solar panel, which is much bigger than this one. This is just one to show an example of. Um, and it actually had a built-in battery pack. So it's stored it up inside there. This one here, you have to connect it up to another block and then it goes to a battery pack. But that means you can actually end up, by the end of the day, charge my phone to 100% from just from the power of the sun. 
that meant we could save all that other power for other things such as the Garmin's and GoPros and cameras and stuff. So it really was a great thing to look for. So yes, solar panels, I don't always carry with me. I very rarely carry them recently. But if I was going away to somewhere nice and hot and sunny, then yeah, do take one. So at the bottom of the list, we then got front and rear lights. It may be summer, but take some because if you're on a road or somewhere scary, please blimmin' put lights on your bike. Um, you can't be anything safer than putting a light on your bike. So just a small little rear light, USB rechargeable again, so if it runs out, you can power it up again. You're not gonna find a double A battery in the wild unless you are recharging yours. But yeah, try and do carry a USB rechargeable rear light and a small front light as well. Just enough to start to see with. So about three, 400 lumen, it's what you need at minimum, a bare minimum on every single trip. So if you're then doing a winter trip, you need lights to see where you're going because most of your journey is gonna be in the dark. And off-road in the dark, you need some powerful last lights. So I use this brand called Exposure. I think they're incredible, but a British brand. This is the Toro. This gives you 1,200 lumens. That will definitely mean you can see where you're going. That coupled up with their headlights, which you put on your helmet for this nice little mount. Um, that is the joystick. I also have a Diablo, um, which is really powerful. Again, that boosts up to a thousand. Why is a helmet light important? Because when you turn a corner off-road, you do first is turn your head. If you only got the lights on the handlebars, you can't turn your handlebars before you start to the corner. So that's why headlight is really important. If I don't carry one of them and I'm getting stuck, but yes, that's where then your head torch comes in. So that you can use as your night light for running along. This one's a nice little small one. This is a ticker, whatever it is, really goes up quite small as a pretzel. They also did this really cool emergency one because it's a nice little case, which is even smaller. So if you don't think you can carry a head torch with you, then at all times of the year, Look at that, it's minute. It's also got good SOS techniques as well um, because it's good flashing if you're stuck somewhere. And also if you have forgotten your rear light, you can use it as a rear light in your head and put the front one on like that. So you've got front and rear lights and then you can definitely see where you're going and people can see you behind. So please do carry something. What's really cool, Exposure then does these ones as well, which then plug into the front lights. So again, you only got to worry about charging one object. Um, and you can also buy a thing that would actually dump charge out of this into your Garmin. So they are heavy and they're really cool, but they are incredible. There is no separate battery packs. That is the battery inside there. Um, and they do great warranties, great repairs, and you'll have it for a lifetime. If you made it this far, well done. But the last two items I'm gonna mention in this epically long video is gonna be a decent pair of sunglasses. These are a set of Oakleys that use trail prism lenses, which actually really give you amazing contrast in any low light or high light. Um, they are really worth the money. Bulletproof, which means if a bit of glass or a bit of rock, a bit of glass, a bit of rock comes flying into your face, you're gonna be protected, especially a tree as well. Um, I sweat quite a lot, so I'm not really a fan of wearing sunglasses, but I found these are the most comfortable, the best wrap around as well, and stop my eyes streaming and all those descents. The last object we could possibly um, carry with you, which is another luxury item, but makes things really fun and interesting, is a set of binoculars. These are not great ones, but I tell you what, in Scotland, seeing birds, seeing some seals and stuff like that. And if you're camping in the evening, you might want to do a bit of otter spotting if you can get some, or otter watch you used to call it each night, and I never found one until the next day. Um, but yeah, I would say they're quite a really fun, useful thing to take with you. And that's it. We have reached the end of navigation and electronics. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but if you've made it to the end, congratulations. I feel as tired as you guys as well. But that's covered a lot of points. Please put down questions below. I can put links to stuff as well. Um, and also, if you think I've missed something, which I'm sure I haven't, but please put let me know and I'll try and mention it in another video. This also equals a lot of breakaway videos we can do. We can do navigation independently, map reading, how to plot a route, how to get inspired by routes from books and maps and stuff, um, how to use your Garmin, uh, how to film. We're gonna do loads of filming videos, hopefully in the future, kind of film techniques, top things. But I hope you've got a basis of what I carry with me and what gear I've got with me. I don't always carry all of that every single trip, but I have to say probably 99% of that comes with me. But, Massive, massive thank you. I hope you're having amazing adventures. 
And until next time, ciao for now. Mm -hmm.